In this video, we're going to be looking at the life cycle of a star. This has the potential to be one of your six mark questions, so learn it! The stages that a star go through during its life cycle depends on one property alone, its mass. A star with a mass similar to that of the Sun will follow this path through its life cycle, whereas a star that is greater than four or five times the mass of the Sun will follow this path. Again, the outcome at the end of this life cycle depends on its mass. Interestingly enough, the more massive a star is, the shorter its lifespan. All stars start life as a nebula. A nebula is a huge, diffuse cloud of predominantly hydrogen gas that slowly starts to collapse under the force of gravity. Gravity causes the nebula to collapse inwards on itself, getting smaller and smaller as gravity gets stronger. As the nebula collapses, the particles get closer and closer together, causing increased friction between them, generating heat. This heat leads to an increase of pressure, which pushes back against the gravity, slowing the collapse of the star. This pressure is not strong enough to stop the collapse of the cloud, but it will continue to increase as the nebula gets smaller and smaller and the temperature inside it gets hotter and hotter. This takes us to the next stage in the star's life cycle where it becomes a protostar. A protostar is not yet a proper star. Instead, it is just a very hot cloud of densely packed gas. The pressure exerted outwards is just not strong enough to counteract the force of gravity, so this protostar continues to shrink, and the core gets hotter and hotter until nuclear fusion begins. An important point to note here is that nuclear fusion only happens in the core. That is the only place where the temperature and pressure are great enough to allow it to happen. Nuclear fusion only occurs in the core of the star where the temperatures are highest. Hydrogen atoms combine together under great pressure and temperature to form helium nuclei and at the same time release immense amounts of energy. This extra energy is in the form of heat, thus increasing the pressure sufficient to counteract that of the gravity. The star stops from collapsing and maintains a stable radius. When nuclear fusion first starts, the outer layers of the star are blown away pushed back into space by that sudden increase in pressure and can later go on to form planets. Our Sun is currently in this stage of its life cycle. It will be a main sequence star for the next four and a half billion years or so. More massive stars will have much shorter life cycles because the pressure needed in the core has to be much greater to counteract their stronger gravity, so fusion happens at a much faster rate, using up the hydrogen fuel much more quickly. As the hydrogen in the core begins to run out, the star starts to cool and shrink again, thus generating increased friction in the core, increasing the core temperature even further. For a star the mass of the Sun, this core temperature should be enough to trigger the fusion of the next element up from hydrogen, helium. Helium requires much greater energies in order to fuse. Just like before, when this new fusion reaction starts, the outer layers of the Sun will be pushed backwards, forming a red giant. To give you some perspective, the red giant that the Sun would form should probably have a radius very similar to that of Earth's current orbit, which is not very good for us. That said, if humanity is still stuck on Earth in four and a half billion years, we probably deserve it. Eventually, all that helium in the core is going to be used up and fusion will stop again. This will cause the entire sun to start shrinking again, thus heating up the core thanks to increased friction. However, for the sun, it's never going to reach temperatures in the core great enough to allow the fusion of heavier elements. As a result, our star will then go on to the next stage in its life, a white dwarf. A white dwarf is technically not a star by a definition of having nuclear fusion reactions going on in the core. Instead, it's just a very hot ball of the remaining gases of our star. To give you a size comparison, the white dwarf star that our sun will become is it's just slightly smaller than the planet Earth itself. It would have a very strong gravitational pull simply because it is so dense 
in comparison. It has the entire mass of a sun in the same size as the Earth. To start off with, it would be very hot still, thanks to the friction caused by all those densely packed particles colliding with one another and losing their energy to heat. However, as time goes on, because there's no fusion reaction to sustain that heat, it will slowly start to cool until eventually it becomes a brown and then a black dwarf. Brown and black dwarfs are just the end state of the star. They are getting cooler and cooler and therefore producing less and less light. For stars greater than about four or five times the mass of our sun, a different route is taken. The life cycle stays roughly the same until the star becomes a red supergiant. At this stage it is still fusing helium. However, because the star is much more massive, much greater core temperatures can be achieved allowing heavier elements to be fused in the core. It will work its way up the periodic table until it gets to iron. Iron is the death sentence of a star. Once the core starts filling with fused iron, fusion stops in that area. And as more and more iron builds up, this leads to a core that is very dense, very solid, and where fusion suddenly stops. What will happen then is the remainder of the um, star, not held back by any pressure, will come rushing inwards and BOOM! You have a supernova. The remaining material in the core is crushed, very tightly packed together under immense forces and the outer layers rebound off this solid core and come flying out. For a brief period of time the entire galaxy is outshone by the light and energy emitted by this one star. This is what a supernova is. Now, you might remember this picture from earlier. This is the nebula that we started with. The hydrogen gas that makes up that nebula are the remains, the outer shell of the star that was blown away during that supernova. As a result, stars are made from the remains of other stars. After the supernova, there remains the core of the original star. There are two possibilities for what could happen to this core, and again they depend on the mass. If the mass is high enough, a black hole forms. If the mass is not high enough, you end up with a neutron star. Now, a neutron star has roughly one and a half times the mass of the Sun. Remember, you've lost a lot of mass from these very big stars ejected outwards to form a nebula as part of the supernova. But all of that mass, one and a half times the mass of the Sun, fits within a very, very small amount of space. The star shown in the diagram is approximately 12 miles in diameter. One teaspoon of neutron star material, neutronium, would have the same mass as the planet Earth. It is incredibly heavy, it is spinning incredibly fast, and it's pretty damn hot. Neutron stars are pretty much pure neutrons. All the protons and electrons have been forced together to form neutrons from the material to fit in as tight a place as possible. Interesting enough, you could consider one neutron star to be one giant nucleus of an atom made of pure neutrons, or close enough pure neutrons. For very massive stars, though, something very weird happens to the core. It collapses under the immense pull of gravity and continues to collapse, getting smaller and smaller and smaller all that mass collapsing downwards until it reaches something called a singularity, a zero-dimensional point where all the material takes up less than the space of a full stop. This is a black hole. I've shown you a picture of a black hole. It's just here. It's a little bit hard to see because it's black and so is space. That said, astronomers can see the effects of black holes. They bend light nearby them. We believe that the centre of most galaxies contains a supermassive black hole that everything else orbits around. This concludes our video on the life cycle of stars. Please, please, if you're answering a six mark question about this, talk about the processes that drive the evolution of the star. Talk about the fact that mass is very important for deciding which route a star will take. And at every stage you need to talk about gravity and pressure. Gravity starts off causing a nebula to collapse. It collapses inwards. Friction causes an increase in temperature in the center of the cloud. 
Eventually, temperatures in the core are great enough to initiate nuclear fusion of hydrogen. This is where a protostar becomes a main star, an average star. After fusion finishes, the core will shrink, heat up again, and trigger the red giant stage of the life cycle of the star. For an average star like our Sun, that will be it for fusion. Once the helium has finished fusing in the core, it will shrink to a white dwarf and eventually turn to a brown and a black dwarf. For a much larger star than the Sun, you will end up with a supernova after the red supergiant, and then either a neutron star or a black hole, depending on the mass of the star originally. The greater the mass of the star, the more likely it is to become a black hole, otherwise a neutron star. Thank you for listening.